So, uh, the goal for, uh, the goal is to get through this paper. This paper is a um, a topical study of, of a very brief topical study overview of the concept of justification in Job. And if we have time after that, then I'll actually walk through the book some some more and just kind of show you how it how it uh, connects. Um, and as Josh was telling me earlier, since I'm not in school, I don't have to like hedge my bets because what the nerds do in school, they're like, oh, you can't talk about justification in Job or what do you mean by this and that? It's like, well, I'm just going to talk about it. So <laughs> we're going to show it. So um, you can, if you guys have your notes or if not, that's fine. Um, we're, we're just going to... First, we're going to look at a couple of basic definitions of justification just as so that they're fresh in our mind. I'm sure you guys have been over this a lot of times, um, but a few basic definitions. One is, uh, it's a Christian doctrine concerning how believers are declared to be in the right with God through their faith in Jesus Christ. And um, there are obviously a lot more, there can be a lot more that can be said about justification than just that. But I'm trying to give us a very basic because what we're going to look at in Job is the most stripped down essential elements of what it means to be right in God's sight. So uh, the biblical teaching about how believers are declared to be right before God even though they're not righteous in themselves or it is a declarative act of God by which he establishes persons as righteous. Um, justification is the declaring of a person to be just or righteous. It is a legal term signifying acquittal. Um, so once again, there are more like the whole idea of imputed like imputed righteousness and penal penal substitution. Those are um, if you want to get more expansive on it, those are a part of it. But we're just looking at the basic what the words actually mean right now. So you can see in the notes or just listen there's kind of two main words used for justification well two main verbs that talk about justifying somebody um, in, in the Bible to be just and to be like righteous are kind of the same word but when we're, when we're talking about the actual act of being justified uh, there's the two there's the Greek word dikaio and the Hebrew word sadak which is going to be very important for our lesson tonight. Um, the Hebrew root means conformity to an ethical or moral standard. So that's basically, like at the very, very basic level, just that word means this. And um, conforming to a standard. So it doesn't have to have God in view. You, if we made up our own like law court, and uh, Danny could be like justified according to like whatever standard that we set. Mm -hmm. Like, did he play like music well tonight? Yes, okay, Danny's been justified by us. Mm -hmm. That's basically all it means is that somebody is in accordance to a standard. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, when we talk about the biblical use of it, somebody's just if they're in accordance with God's standard of holiness. So what's really interesting is like, why talk about the book of Job? Like, why did Josh want me to come up here and talk about the book of Job when you guys are in Romans? Um, good question. Uh, if you just do a simple word count, when we talk about the act of justifying, Job actually has more occurrences of the verb to justify than any other Old Testament book. It occurs 17 times in Job and 24 times in all the other Old Testament books put together. So, obviously we can read too much into just like word studies but usually when we think about okay what does the Old Testament say about justification or how you're saved we think about like Isaiah or the law but we don't think about Job and yet Job talks about it just physically by word count talks about it more than any other book actually more than the entire other Old Testament um, so that means it's going to have something important to say about it. And it talks about other uh, aspects of it a few times. But if you look on the, your next page, Job's heavy use of verbal language, though, means Job is more concerned with how a person can be justified than with the nature of righteousness. In other words, 
The Book of Job is concerned with how a person can, can be in a right relationship with God. So that's, that's one of its main concerns. Um, there are also more legal terms, such as to answer, to uh, judge, justice, call, lawsuit, vindication, m mediator, um, and Job than any other Old Testament book per capita. Um, I'm throwing a lot of words at you, and I'm, that's all just to kind of prove to you guys that, um, or just to show you guys, uh, that the book of Job, we should start thinking about like Job is one of the primary books to think about when it comes to how we're saved. Um, some scholars argue that the entire book of Job can be described in legal metaphors or that the book of Job unfolds like a lawsuit drama. Mm -hmm. um, I have the scholars there that talk about it. You guys probably won't ever read it. That's mainly for Josh, if he ever wants to. <laughs> <laughs> or Danny. Um, uh, the book of Job centers around two courtroom dramas, a heavenly courtroom between God and Job and an earthly courtroom between Job and his friends. So. Uh, there are also many verbal parallels in contrast to righteousness in Job, such as um, like wickedness, guilty, pure, iniquity, anger, or wrath. Virtually every speech in Job is laced with language related to justification. So all of that, if, if, you just, if you're just reading through Job and you just read those words and just you, you know to look for those words, you're like, oh, wow, Job actually talks about this all the time, mm -hmm. and we'll, uh, once we gather, finish gathering the data, we can put it together and kind of see why does Job talk about this so much. Going back to one of the questions people have about Job, like if Job is all about how to trust God when you suffer, then why does it talk about justification so much? It's a very interesting question to think about. Um, we can also, Job also uses not just legal terms, but also grace and salvation. It talks about that actually quite quite a lot. It, Job and his friends discuss topics like grace, repentance, restoration, appeals to God's mercy. Um, and that's just an overview where you can see that the different characters in Job all talk about these things. So Job's friends believe that God is gracious, but it's conditioned on your repentance. El Elihu believes God's grace is something God does for a sinner apart from what they do. Um, Job kind of doubts the grace of God. He goes back and for forth on that. Uh, Job and his friends also discuss the role of a heavenly mediator in salvation. Um, Eliphaz does not believe a mediator would help Job because he thinks about grace as like, God is gracious to you if you do stuff mm -hmm. for him or if you do the right things. And so why would somebody from heaven help you out, Job? Um, Job hopes that a mediator would enable forgiveness of sins and restoration of fellowship between him and God. Um, and we'll talk about like how Job could know about that or think about that. Mm -hmm. um, Elihu exhorts Job to not lose hope in the possibility of a mediator bringing salvation. Job and his friends also talk about forgiveness of sins. So, once again, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar believe forgiveness is conditioned on Job's repentance. But, and this part is really interesting, they ultimately believe repentance is pointless because man is inherently sinful and before a holy and infinite God, so it doesn't really matter what man does, good or bad. They're just going to be judged by God anyway. Um, uh, Job wishes for and believes that God would be kind if God would were to forgive him of his sinfulness. That kind of begins to answer the question of the, the connection between suffering and justification in Job. Um, Elihu believes forgiveness of sins can happen through a ransom provided through a heavenly mediator. So some of the words that I say there, if they sound like Christian salvation is because that's what they're talking about. Um, obviously, they weren't in the progress of like God's word. They weren't. At, they 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 didn't know physically as much as later authors and characters did. Um, 
but they were very smart people. They are very wise people. And when you just think about some very basic concepts about who God is, that leads to some inevitable conclusions. Mm. Um, so they also talk about the holiness and justice of God. So they all understand God to be infinite in holiness and sovereign justice. Um, let's see. Job and his friends have different views on the possibility of man's justification before a holy God. So all the characters in Job, including God, but um, all the characters in Job talk about how to be justified before God. Um, Job's friends believe justification is impossible because, again, like you can repent, but ultimately you can't match with the holiness of God. So like no one will ever be pure in God's sight. It's kind of a hopeless, hopeless like worldview. Mm -hmm. Unlike Job's friends, though, when Job, uh, Job agrees with them uh, in Job 9.2 that no man can ultimately be pure in God's sight or justified, but Job has faith to imagine or hope for a way that man could be justified in, by, by God. So he's trying to think out, outside the box, like, uh, basically back in Job's time they pretty much thought that well at least Job thought that he was doing alright with God because he lived a God fearing blessed life he, he was pure and upright but then he gets crushed like absolutely crushed and loses everything and that makes him think about what kind of person God is and uh, that might be getting ahead of ourselves a bit, but that's, that is the connection between suffering and justification is the reason why when bad things happen, why they're bad is not because they're inherently bad in themselves, it's because yeah, that says something about the character of God, or that possibly says something about the character of God. Um, like how James 1 says to count of all joy when bad things happen to us because God works through them. Um, probably the most common um, argument that I've heard against the existence of God is not an argument against his existence, but against his character. Like, why would a good God allow this? Um, when, when bad things happen to us, we generally want them to stop, right? And when we want them to stop, then that kind of makes us think about and ask about the most important questions in life. And the most important question anybody can have is, is not why do, it's, it's like this bad thing shouldn't have happened to me, it's why did it happen? Um, and Job is thinking along those tracks as well, because if you read Job carefully, Job 1 and 2, Job blesses God when he suffers. He passes those tests, um, Satan is never talked about again directly in the book. Um, then you get to Job 3 and Job wishes he was never born and you have to ask like how, did, how, how does he get from praising God to saying I wish I was never born and in Job 3 Job asks questions why would God let this happen to me if life is just pointless and so if, we, if you follow his train of thought then it kind of makes sense why Job would talk so much about justification because um, he thinks God is treating him like a sinner and he knows God can do that because he is a sinner. Mm -hmm. Job's friends, they don't really have that much faith in God. And so they're like, yeah, we're basically done for. God can just gonna, he's just going to crush us like ants. And that's the point of life. And they kind of imply through their words that mankind's purpose in life is just to do enough good works to appease God and get through life. Um, but there's no hope ultimately in that. Job wishes for a way that he could know that God cares about him even when bad things happen. And that it's not because of his sin that suffering is happening. So if he knows that God views him as a righteous person in spite of his sin, then he can trust God and be really have peace with whatever happens. So... Um, yeah, that's the that's kind of the side trail from what we were going through here, but I felt like it'd be good to connect that so mm -hmm. it's not just a bunch of like mm -hmm. word studies being thrown thrown at you guys, but 
that is ultimately the reason why Job talks about it so much. And uh, even in Romans 8, uh, why Paul says we can trust that God loves us, it's not simply because God says so, it's because of the intercession of the Son, the, the mediation of the, of the Son. That's why we can know that God cares about us, and that's what Job hoped for. So, that was just for free, but we might circle back around to that later. But that's, that's Job is really the, if you understand Job, you can answer the so-called problem of evil that people have and um, really get to the, the root of why they don't believe in God. Um, so then, another reason why we can talk about Job and justification is the date of the writing of Job. So I would argue that Job is the earliest written book of the Bible. So whatever he says is automatically going to be there for later authors to use. So by definition, and what's cool about Job is that Job is set outside of Israel and before Israel was even a nation. And so when we think about justification, in the Old Testament, we think about uh, Genesis 15:6. Abraham like believed God and it was credited to him or accounted to him as like righteousness. Um, by happening outside of Israel and before the covenants, we get a very stripped down, in a good way, a very stripped down of like what is the most essential elements of the relationship between God and man. Like what should constitute the most basic foundational elements of man's relationship to God. And that's what Job is able to give us. And guess what? It talks about justification as that one of the foundational, if not the foundational element. Um, because it's not just a doctrine. It's how God, it's the proof that God cares about us, right? It's the proof that God has a, pro, has a, has a plan to solve the problem of evil. Um, even on just another application note, I did a paper on uh, Job and social justice that I think I talked about once. Job and his friends are all aware and they even talk about suffering around the world. And Job's friends, trying to defend the character of God, say, well, actually, there's no such thing as unjust suffering. So all those people like suffering around the world, that's because they deserve it. Job was like, well... If you just look around you, you see all kinds of people getting oppressed and beat down and bad things happening to them. But they never talk about what, what they are going to do about it or what the government is going to do about it. I'm not saying that there's not a place for those things, but what they understand as the primary issue is why would God allow that? You know, What kind of God would allow these kinds of things? And so that, again, ties back into... Does God have a plan? Does God care? Is God just in the end? And justification tells us yes to all of those things. So how does the book of Job understand justification? Um, the book of Job teaches that justification is something that ultimately happens between God and man that brings man into a blessed relationship with him. I'll go through the verses as we have time to kind of expand on that. Uh, but, however, due to the infinite gap between God's holiness and man's inherent sinfulness, man's justification before God is impossible to accomplish by normal means, since God would violate his own justice and holiness by declaring a sinner to be morally pure in his sight. Uh, mankind can be righteous relative to each other, but lack the perfect moral purity that God requires to be righteous in his law court. That's exactly how the book of Job frames it. Um, and that sounds exactly what how Romans would talk about it. And it's because it's the, the same thing. Um, it is possible for sinful mankind to be justified and for God to remain just and holy if a mediator represents man to God enables forgiveness of sin, and brings a ransom for their sin before God. Again, that sounds like the gospel, because it is. I mean, it's, it's, it's not the like Genesis 3.15 promise, 
of the gospel. Otherwise, I don't think Job would have had all the questions that he, he had. Um, but these guys just knew, okay, God is holy, I'm not. How can that gap be possibly bridged? You know, if God is gracious, there has to be a way to pay for my sin and for God to be just while still calling me just. So if you just, these, again, these, these guys were smart and they thought about it like logically and biblically. So while Job despairs, ultimately Job despairs of attaining the perfect righteousness that God requires, Elihu holds out hope that God by his grace would give his righteousness to men. And that's what Elihu specifically says. He talks about a mediator finding a ransom for Job to pay for his sin and that God would give his righteousness to him. And you're like, wow, yeah, Job, Job actually like talks about imputed righteousness? And it's like, yeah, he does. Um, mm -hmm. Elihu is awesome. He talks mm -hmm. about all this stuff. Um, I kind of talked about this next section already. Why does Job talk about justification so much? Um, Job believes the most important thing to know in life is how God relates to you and the world. So, once again, if we go through a hard time, really, we have joy. We can have joy and we should have joy in it because, as James 1, Romans 8, 28, Philippians 4, 20, I, I think, there's all kinds of passages that talk about because God has done this, because God is like this, you can have hope and joy in Him. Um, ultimately, our relationship to God and God's, relation, God's view of us and how God is towards us colors everything, whether we know it or not. Um, and that's something that we need to, we always need to get our minds off of like, oh, this bad thing happened, this, is, this shouldn't have happened, and, or these bad things are happening in the world, it shouldn't be happening. We should be thinking about, okay, what does this say about God, and what is God doing about it, or going to do about it, and can I trust God, should I trust God in that, and the answer is yes. Um, the book of Job understands justification to be the primary doctrine that shapes man's relationship to God. So that's why it talks about it so much. It shapes your relationship to God. If you're not justified, you don't know God, God doesn't know you. Um, and in Job, if there is no possibility of justification, um, God is just, right? Like if I've, I've heard very re respected teachers say that God could kill all of us and he would still be just. He could send everyone on earth to hell and he would still be just. And that's true. But would God still be gracious if he did that? Would God still be kind if he did that? Is God a tyrant that just creates man to bludgeon them to death and then mm -hmm. die? That's what Job thought for a while at least. Mm -hmm. um, he actually tells God to just like, leave me alone so that I can just die, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, so there is an aspect of kind of getting into more of like why God created man. Um, if there was no sin and suffering, God wouldn't have an opportunity to glorify himself through grace and salvation and all of that. And I think once God ordained that Adam and Eve would fall in into sin, once Satan tempted them into sin, what that really is, is that's a challenge to the wisdom of God. It's like, hey, uh, the way that I say is actually better than what God says. And he tempted them to fall, they chose sin. And if God doesn't have a plan for that, uh, Dr. Chow has used the illustration, if like if, if you paint, paint something and then you like crumple it up and toss it in the trash, that means you made a mistake. Like you couldn't fix it. You messed it up beyond repair. So you just had to like toss it and and start over. So the question that sin poses to God ultimately is: Has Satan beaten God by tricking or by tempting man into sin? Like if if God can't fix the problem of sin, then Satan won. And Satan's way of doing things is at least more powerful than God's way. Because God can't fix it. And so 
that pro like Satan probably thinks or at least thought that he had God on the ropes because it's like he knows God is holy, he knows man is in sin, and it's like okay, I've got I've got God beat. Like I, God can't justify a sinful person because otherwise he would violate his own holiness. Um, but God in His wisdom creates has created a way for man to be justified in His sight. And that is why I think, because if you think about it, the book of Job is in wisdom literature. So it's, it's in the same, uh, when we think about Job, we think about it in, in the same way as like Ecclesiastes or Proverbs. Um, and so justification really proves that God is wise. God runs this world, not just, he r runs this world in the best possible way he has a plan to fix it in the end. We can trust God to be wise and kind and run this world better than we can. Um, and that's why Paul quotes Job in Romans 11, 35, uh, when he taught, praises the wisdom of God. He quotes Job there. So, now the question is, does Paul use Job to develop his doctrine of ju justification? There are not a lot of sources that talk about this. That's why I'm... I'm doing research in it, but I have notes there. You can look it up. There's a few places. Um, Romans 3.19. Uh, one of my favorites is 1 Timothy 2.5-6. Trying to think about what, how much time do I have left? Yeah. Sorry, I didn't even know yeah. when I started. Yeah, you've got time. You've got, uh, let's see. <laughs> Time. Yeah, you can take another 15 to 20 minutes. Okay. Um, let's see. I think what, what I'll do is I'll just get into a few passages just so you guys can kind of see it in the time that we have left. Um, yeah, so. You can open your Bibles now. I had a lot of references there, but if I went through them, we'd be here for like a long time. Um, so, you can turn to, well, I guess turn to Job 4.17. First of all, this is Eliphaz speaking, Job's friend. He is speaking to Job. He's saying, hey, you know, if you repent, God will do great things for you. Uh, but then he says this in Job 4.17. Can a mankind be just before God? Can a man be pure before his maker? Uh, that's, can a man be justified in God's sight? He's basically saying, look, there's no possible way man can be seen as good in God's sight. We are hopeless. And you can also see why um, they, Job's friends, so strongly defend this idea that there is no undeserved suffering. Everybody that suffered is because of some sin that, that they did. Because um, if, if God, if uh, God treats somebody based off of his own will, not based off of what they've done, then uh, their entire worldview falls apart. But then Eliphaz contradicts himself and says, well, ultimately we kind of all are terrible anyways. And so um, it doesn't matter in the long run. But, but then you turn to Job 9, and we'll just stay in Job 9 just for focus and time's sake. Um, Job 9, verse 2. In truth, I know that this is so, but how can a man be in the right before God? So he says basically, he says the same thing as Eliphaz, and he agrees that God is perfectly just, um, but he disagrees with how God goes goes about that and he's hopeless um, he's, he says if one wished to dispute with him he could not answer him once in a thousand times um, he basically says look I if there was a way for a man to work his way into a blessed relationship with God it would have been me because I was faithful I loved God I did all these good things and yet it wasn't enough like I was pretty much as perf close to perfect as you can get from a human perspective, but from God's perspective, it was pointless. God just crushed 
me and my family and uh, all at once. So he, he's like, all right, I get that man can't be just in God's sight, but does that mean, I think that means God is like a tyrant. If God is going to be like that, then does God even care? Like, does it matter whether a person does good or bad? Joe even talks about that later in uh, verses 22 through 24, some of the strongest words in the Bible about uh, God. Job says, it is all one. Basically, all of life is the same thing. It doesn't really matter. Um, Therefore, I say, he destroys the guiltless and the wicked. If the scourge kills suddenly, he mocks the despair of the innocent. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covers the faces of its, its judges. If it is not he, then who is it? Those are some pretty harsh uh, words that Job has, and they're obviously not correct in one sense, but they are correct, and Job understands that God is sovereign, and he does look at the world around him and see the the evil mm-hmm. every day, and he's like, look, if it doesn't matter what mankind does, then God's just, he pretty much says that God is just a jokester that creates mankind and has fun in like torturing them whether they do good or bad mm-hmm. those are some very dark thoughts about God that Job says probably yeah like what Job says ab- about God throughout this book is probably the darkest in the Bible and that's just on a applicational note that's very helpful for us because mm-hmm. it's in God's word so that we don't have to think through those on our own Um, If we have these doubts or temptations, we can look to Job and see somebody that has gone through it who didn't have the rest of God's word and see how God worked through that with with Job. Um, But um, God put put these things in here for us to think through. But Job is, Mm -hmm. if we take a step back again and think about this, Job has gone through like suffering and then he says well how can man be just does does God not care at all so he's saying again if there's no way for man to be holy then okay God may be just but God is a jerk the the biggest jerk in the world Um, because yeah it's like yeah of course like we're all sinners there's no hope for us we get that but if there's no way to be justified, then it's like, well, who cares? You know, just eat and drink f- mm. for tomorrow. We might die. And it's a pretty bleak worldview. And that's that's actually how this a lot of this world thinks, um, in America at least. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're very hopeless and like nihilistic and there's no point in life and just do like whatever you want because you might die. Um, they've kind of gotten to that point where Job, Job already got to a long, long time ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so this can be used to reach them if you're ever evangelizing them. But um, Job has has a hope. He says, if, if you go down to uh, verses 25 through 31, Job basically says, even if I proved in your law court, God, that I was pure, you could like make me impure. That's how holy God is and how Job can't escape his own sinfulness before God. It's not that he did anything to deserve that specific like suffering, but that his human nature, you can't escape that. Job thought he could, but he couldn't. Then he says this, For he is not a man as I am, that I may answer him, that we may go to court together. There is no umpire between us who may lay his hand upon us both. Let him remove his rod from me. Let not dread of him terrify me. Then I would speak and not fear him, but I am not like that in myself. So what is Job trying to to say here? He, He says, the reason why I can't stand in God's law court is because God is not like me. He's holy. He's infinite in his justice and might. Uh, he says earlier in verse 10, like, I can't even see God. You know, God can do, God can pass right in front of me and I can't even see him. Um, 
But by implication, he's asking for somebody that can represent him to, to God. He says, there is no umpire or mediator between us who may lay his hand upon us both. So he's talking about somebody who can put his hand on not just man, but on God. Somebody who can represent both sides, both man and God, and uh, somehow enable forgiveness of sins. Uh, Job says, let him re remove his rod from me. Let not dread of him terrify me. So he won't be afraid of God's holiness and his justice because God's rod of wrath will be removed from him because of the mediator. Um, that's a pretty amazing statement to make. And um, we'll go to one more passage in the New Testament that kind of, I think, draws on this. Uh, before that, Josh wanted me to mention imputed righteousness, so I'll do that real quick. You can go to Job 33. And Elihu, who is the first biblical counselor, defends the justice of God better than anybody else. Uh, 33. Um, basically, Job at this point in the book, he's lost hope that God would provide that like mediator and he's justified himself. He's like, you know what? I, I don't need God to, I don't need to be seen as justified in God's sight. I can do it myself. Elihu is calling him out on this and he's exhorting Job to hold out hope. He says, verse 13, why do you complain against him that he does not give an account of all his doings? So he's like, why do you, why are you saying God doesn't care? God doesn't have a plan. God is, is mean just because God doesn't tell you everything that he does. Um, then he talks about ways that God does uh, communicate without speaking but then he gets down to to this verse 23 he's holding out hope he's 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 like job i heard what you were saying about a mediator and don't lose hope that that's true he says if there is an angel as mediator for him one out of a thousand to remain to remind a man what is right for him then let him be gracious to him that's that's one of the that is that word for grace like an act of grace or mercy so he's talking about God being gracious and he's not saying Job if you repent God will be gracious to you that's what Job's friend said he just says let God be gracious to this person deliver him from going down to the pit that is death I have found a ransom um, that's a payment for sin it is the same word used throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament in Greek and all that uh, for ransom or redemption let his flesh become fresher than in youth let him return to the days of his youthful vigor uh, then he will pray to God and he will accept him so as a response to God's grace that he may see his face with joy and he may restore his righteousness to man and that word for restore is it, it, it can mean either restore or to give to somebody so um, Elihu's saying, look, I know what you're saying, Job, and don't lose hope that it, that it could be true. You're, you're saying a man can't be just in God's sight, that God is, is a jerk. What if there was a way? What if God could pay for your sin and actually make you righteous like him? Um, obviously, we know from the rest of the Bible that that's true, but that's God put Job through all of this without the Bible so that they would think through these things and the benefit for us is that we get to see um, how can we know that God is right even when bad things happen to us even when there's suffering well if we un understand Job it's because God has a plan to end evil and to make people right with himself um, Job also talks about like resurrection but we don't have time for that um, but in short, he connects resurrection to justification. Um, if, so, if the last passage, if you guys turn to First Timothy, uh, chapter two, verses five and six. 
it's uh, interesting, the words, man, Uh, the, the words that Paul uses are very intentional here. We are used to thinking about, um, listen to the phrasing that Paul says here. For there is one God and one mediator, that's the same word that Job uses in Job 9, 32, um, 3, and one mediator also between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. That's a, Paul doesn't usually talk about Jesus as the man, Christ Jesus. He usually talks about like um, Jesus being from God, he's able to pay for sins and all that. But he emphasizes that Jesus is a mediator because he's not just God, he's also man. He's able to bring both God and man together who gave himself as a ransom, which is the same word in Job, for all the testimony given at the proper time. Um, so Paul is saying, at the very least, he's thinking about the same concepts that Job was thinking about. Like, we can be right with God because there is God's own son is also man, and he... Uh, is that ransom for us. And we can be justified because of what Jesus did. So, that was kind of non-stop. Um, but that was a brief overview of in Job. And I hope that was kind of like that. Some of you guys already, already know about this because you've been in the Job Bible study. Um, but there's, there's a lot more to Job than what we think at first. And I think Paul, Job was one of the main sources that Paul drew upon to discuss his doctrine of justification. If you want to, there's a couple more verse references for that. Romans 3, 3.19 talks about kind of every mouth being stopped up by, by the law. That's a phrase that uh, is found in Job a lot because a big deal there is they're in Job and his friends and Job and God are in a law court battle over who is right and who is wrong and if you can't answer then you're wrong and ultimately Job's friends can't answer Job and then Job can't answer God and he can only be silent lay his hand over his mouth and admit that God is justified um, and the law does that same thing and then Romans 3:26. Paul calls God the just and the justifier. You think about why would God, why would Paul even need to say that? Why, why can't he just say God is the one who justifies man? Because he can't justify a sinner without violating his own justice. Unless there is a way for both God and man to be just. Mm. And that's what Job talked about. And uh, I think Paul drew upon that. Not a lot of people have written on it, but I, I think it's because when people talk about Job, it's like, bad times, trust God, you know, that's basically, mm -hmm. and it's yeah. like, why does he talk about stuff for 38 chapters or whatever, mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. there's a lot more though, and I hope that uh, was helpful to you guys, any questions or comments?